I could write down arbitrary Hamiltonians, but uh, there is no guarantee that this would actually represent a realizable physical system or anything. Uh, our approach rather has been to say that all the physical systems we know of we assume are Hamiltonian systems and then you try to model the, the physics of these systems by model Hamiltonians. So necessarily Hamiltonians are models, abstr abstractions trying to approximate some reality. Now most physical systems have a lot of interaction with other physical systems and therefore one of the crucial and important points is to find out how to include these interactions in a reasonable manner. And this is a non-trivial problem. So it is a, it's a problem of modeling and then of course there is no guarantee that given a Hamiltonian you can actually find the eigenvalues and eigenstates analytically. That is a separate question for that you have to solve the Schrodinger equation. And as you know the number of solvable integrable classical mechanical problems is itself small the number of integrable quantum mechanical problems is even smaller. So it is not, uh, uh, not immediately doable. Uh, let me give you an instance of precisely this point. You know that if you took the one dimensional simple harmonic oscillator it is integrable it is in the Hamiltonian sense it is it is integrable. Uh, now if you took an anharmonic oscillator which is of the form uh, h of x and p is equal to 1 half p squared 1 over 2 m p squared plus 1 half m omega squared x squared that is of course integrable classically. Quantum mechanically we will solve this problem and show that its energy levels are uh, actually calculable computable analytically. But if you add to this some lambda x to the power 4 for instance make it an anharmonic oscillator with some positive constant lambda then classically the problem is integrable still because every 1 degree of freedom system is actually integrable. The Hamiltonian equal to constant E is in fact this equation to the phase curves the phase trajectories but quantum mechanically this problem is not solvable in closed form you cannot find the energy levels of this system exactly. You can of course find them to arbitrary accuracy by good perturbation methods but you cannot find them exactly. So in fact you see that quantum mechanics in that sense is more difficult than classical mechanics even the few integrable problems in classical mechanics are not necessarily integrable in quantum mechanics. Uh, we will see why. Okay. It is immediately related of course to the non-commutativity of x and p that is what makes it immediately more difficult to solve. Hmm. All right. So we talked a little bit yesterday about uh, the problem of a particle in a box and then in two dimensions and then in three dimensions and so on. It gets progressively harder to impose these boundary conditions as the shape of the box becomes more and more complicated but one important lesson we learned was that the moment you go to higher dimensions it is possible to have degeneracies in the spectrum may not always be the case like we saw in the case of a rectangular box in which the lengths the ratio of the lengths of the two sides is incommensurate but under suitable conditions if there is suitable symmetry in the problem then the levels can become degenerate. So the lesson I want you to remember right now is symmetry implies degeneracy in quantum mechanics and we will see exploit this fact as we go along and see how what important how important a role it plays okay. One aspect I want to mention right now and which we will return to uh, later on has to do with the nature of symmetry in quantum mechanics as opposed to symmetry in classical mechanics. It is a very very deep uh, profound implications 
but let me mention this right now and then we will return to this when we do three dimensional problems and let me do this by way of a simple example. In classical mechanics if you look at a particle uh, making a, executing a circular orbit around an attracting center you have a situation where the hydrogen atom for example or the Kepler problem you have a, a particle going around in an orbit in this fashion let us assume for simplicity it is a circular orbit then we know that the angular momentum of this particle is constant under a 1 over r force or any central force and we also know that the angular momentum is not 0 it is clearly not equal to 0 because it is equal to mv times the distance in magnitude and that is certainly not equal to 0. On the other hand when you do the Bohr theory of the electron in a hydrogen atom you are advised that uh, the angular momentum mvr is nh this is one of the equations you write down in the Bohr theory saying the magnitude of the angular momentum in an orbit is an integer multiple of Planck's constant that is the first input. And the next input of course is to say that the force is an electrostatic force so you write down the centripetal acceleration which is mv squared over r this is the magnitude of the inward acceleration due to the motion circular motion and this is equal to this is the force and that is equal to the centripetal force the, the attractive force due to the nucleus that is equal to E squared or ZE squared over R squared in magnitude and then you take these two equations and you eliminate and you find V and R okay. this is how you normally do the Bohr atom after that you write n equal to 1, 2, 3 etc and you discover E n is quantized and is proportional to 1 over n squared and if you use as reference level for the energy the fact that when the uh, electron and proton are infinitely separated the energy is 0 the potential energy is 0 then the bound state energies are all negative and they are uh, labeled according to n and it is an infinite sequence of these uh, such bound state energies this much we know from the Bohr theory and the values of n are 1, 2, 3, 4 etc. But there is a little bit of cheating that has been done here this n comes about by quantizing the orbital angular momentum mvr is the orbital angular momentum but we also know that when you solve the Schrodinger equation the ground state of the system has n equal to 1 so this is the ground state. it is also called the 1s state n equal to 1 l equal to 0 m equal to 0 this m is the magnetic quantum number not the mass and this is what you are told is uh, the label for the ground state of the system and it is spherically symmetric this ground state the wave function in fact can be written as psi or I will use the symbol phi for the wave function Eigen function 1 0 0 for these quantum numbers here of r theta phi in spherical polar coordinates this is proportional to a to the minus r over a 0 a 0 is the Bohr radius and there is no angular dependence the ground state is spherically symmetrical but the angular momentum is 0 the orbital angular momentum is 0 how does that tally with this fact that this electron is supposed to be going around in a Bohr orbit in which case its angular momentum is distinctly not 0 how does the how do these pictures match forget the spin this is true independent of the spin of the electron this has nothing to do with the spin of the electron do you see the difficulty the problem is classically if you have a particle orbiting at a distance a naught from the center the angular momentum is not 0 quantum mechanically the ground state this is the correct ground state energy it is proportional to minus 1 in Rydberg units equal to minus 1 Rydbergs the ground state is characterized by principal quantum number 1 orbital angular momentum 0 and therefore the projection quantum number 0 
but L equal to 0 implies that the angular momentum is actually 0. Now how could it possibly be 0 when it is orbiting at a distance A0? Of course you would say the answer is it is not orbiting at a distance A0 there is only a probability density or probability amplitude and indeed the angular momentum is not uh, I mean it is not a strict trajectory and if I plot this wave function if I plot the probability that the electron is at a distance r between r and r plus dr from the uh, nucleus what is that equal to in the ground state what is that equal to that is the probability density so you must find it from the wave function uh, it is equal to mod of this guy squared so this is equal to mod 5100 0 of r let me drop the theta and phi because there is no theta phi dependence there at all in any case you got to integrate over it squared times dr is this correct is this correct if this were true this is equal to e to the minus apart from some constant e to the minus r over 2r over a0 dr and if I sketch this as a function of r if I plot p of r versus r this is a damped exponential. So it says in fact that the probability of finding the electron at the nucleus is much larger than that of finding it anywhere else pardon me yes there is an r squared absolutely right there is an r squared. So what you have to argue is that the actual probability is the wave function of this electron in this state as a function of r mod squared dv this guy is the probability for finding the electron in any volume element dv and now if you say I only want the probability of finding it at a distance r you must integrate over the angles but this dv has its r squared dr d omega where d omega is the solid angle element and when you integrate over d omega you get a famous 4 pi factor and then you have an r squared here. So this is not true there has got to be an r squared dr here is this clear and once you put that in then there is an extra r squared factor and this whole thing changes this is no longer the probability density the right one is with an r squared and then this guy here this r squared is an increasing function of r and e to the minus 2r is a decreasing function of r and the product of the two of course will be something which is like parabol parabolic there and then dies down exponentially and it is not hard to check that this is near a0. So the maximum probability the, the probability density p of r the radial probability density peaks at r0 so the probability of finding this electron in a small interval about a0 is much larger than that of finding it in an interval dr anywhere else that is certainly true still it does not answer this question of how does the angular momentum become 0 because classically the angular momentum can be 0 only if the electron passes through the origin you know if this particle does this back and forth then it is passing through the origin and the distance of closest approach is 0 and therefore the angular momentum is 0 about that point. But if it is most of the time at a distance a0 and is orbiting around the angular momentum cannot be 0 and yet you are told that the exact solution says the angular momentum is 0 but it matches in all other ways the energy level is actually right whatever you get from the Bohr theory is actually right the consequent the conclusion that the electron is exactly at a0 distance is wrong but it is most of the time I mean, predominantly at a0 distance that is right too how does magically the angular momentum become 0 because these guys who write these textbooks they use this relation here and they go through all these conclusions but then when they solve the Schrodinger equation they use the same n for the principal quantum number so they cheated you because here it is really the angular momentum quantum number 
very quietly between one chapter and another they use the same symbol for another quantity altogether and everybody is happy. Hmm. What is the resolution to this? How is it that an electron which is predominantly at a distance a0 has 0 angular momentum? Pardon me? Well you should not think of it as a going through a trajectory that is the first mistake. Quantum mechanically the particle does not have a trajectory at all. If it did then you know its position and momentum instantaneously. So it does not do that but in spite of that how is it that you end up with a 0 angular momentum? quantum mechanically. What fixes the direction of the angular momentum classically? The initial, initial conditions. Initial condition fix the, fixes the plane in which the, uh, the particle moves. Once you tell me R0 and P0 that is it. R cross P is constant and it fixes it. Huh? So classically the symmetry of this central force implies that any initial condition that you impose will forever fix the direction of the orbit that is what conservation of angular momentum means. Huh? And what does rotational symmetry physically mean? It means that if an orbit is permitted in this plane so is it permitted in that plane or that plane because these planes are all related to each other by a rotation of the coordinate axis. What you call the xy plane I may call the yz plane because I simply choose another coordinate system and the physics does not change between yours and mine. So classically and please listen to this classically different solutions which differ in the direction of the angular momentum are related by rotation transformations. You can go from my solution which says that it is orbiting in the xy plane to his solution which says it is orbiting in the yz plane by a rotation of the coordinate axis. So the symmetry transformations here the group of transformations under which the Hamiltonian is invariant namely the rotation group each element of that group of rotations takes you from one possible solution to another possible solution right. What you call initial position momentum I would call it slightly differently in my coordinate system but the two of us are related by a coordinate transformation. And once the physical trans, uh, once you fix a coordinate system and once you specify the initial conditions the orbit is fixed. This is the meaning of symmetry in classical mechanics. Now quantum mechanics however says superposition is valid therefore any solution is a superposition of all possible solutions. That is the crucial role of quantum mechanics of symmetry in quantum mechanics. It says if two solutions are related to each other by a symmetry transformation the general solution is a superposition of these two solutions. You do not have to superpose it nature superposes it does it and then of course it is easy to see if you took this orbit and put it in all possible planes and you added up all the angular momenta what would the net angular momentum be 0. So that is the reason why in quantum mechanics you can still sustain a 0 angular momentum solution even though the electron has overwhelming probability to be at a non-zero distance from the origin. This is a very profound and deep aspect of symmetry in quantum mechanics. It is totally different from what you have in classical mechanics and that is the power of the superposition principle. If you have understood that then a great deal of understanding is gained by on what symmetry really does in quantum mechanics. So you can see that symmetry in quantum mechanics is actually much more powerful a statement than it is in classical mechanics because of this possibility of superposition okay. So we will use this we will exploit this yeah. well we should not use the word most of the time because there is no time involved here these are stationary states so I would say it is most probable value. Ah. Is it ergodic? This is now leading us into very deep waters about quantum ergodicity. So there is no concept of a phase space and a point in phase space in quantum physics. So this question of is it ergodic in this sense is not a very meaningful one. You could ask is it ergodic in some other, yeah. No, no, no these are stationary states completely. These are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So they are completely stationary states. This is just the spatial dependence. 
nothing at all. The time dependence of these states is just an exponential in time that is it just sinusoidal completely. So that, that continues that varies but that is not going to affect probability densities because it is a pure phase factor. So when you take mod psi squared the time dependence goes off completely. So it is not as if things are changing probabilities are changing in time not always true we will look at examples where you have an atom in two possible states and it is flipping between the up state and the down state or a spin flipping between up and down then the probabilities could change in a time dependent way okay. and that is indeed what happens in real physical systems. Now that we did the particle in a box let us get our hand in by doing one more problem and then we will go on to the harmonic oscillator and this is the problem of a particle in a potential. So we looked at it as a free particle uh, inside a box but now let us put in a potential and see what happens. Now one way of doing this is to say uh, what I did last time was to say there is a box of size L and it has got infinite potential here. So this is really like saying there is an infinite barrier on this side and an infinite barrier on this side and the particles inside this box here hmm? because I put V to be infinite outside and 0 inside so the infinite well it is deep inside this well. One could ask what about the problem of a particle inside a finite well so that is my potential uh, so if I draw the potential energy V of X and it is 0 here L here and it is 0 outside this distance here and it is uh, some uh, minus V naught in the particles inside here. If V naught tends to infinity then of course I have the problem of a particle in a box and the question asked is what are the energy levels of this particle what are the possible energy levels. Now it will turn out that the ground state which earlier was strictly like this 0 to L and then vanished at the end can no longer be so and that is immediately clear because recall that our equation was of the form phi double prime plus k squared k n squared phi plus uh, minus v of x phi equal to 0. This was the energy uh, k n here was proportional to the energy. At these points there is a finite discontinuity in the potential so this term has a finite discontinuity phi itself is <coughs> continuous but v of x has a finite discontinuity that must be cancelled by the finite discontinuity here. So if the second derivative has a finite discontinuity it means that the first derivative has a what what can we, would you say about the first derivative what do you think would happen at the ends what would it is certainly not a delta function it is not infinite like it was earlier. So this is going to be much milder and it is not hard to see that in this problem the wave function would in fact spill over because remember we have to solve the problem from minus infinity to infinity really and in this problem the wave function spills over and does something like that. So there is a finite probability for the particle to actually tunnel into the other region but not very far it would damp out. We will solve this problem by and by in fact I am going to give this to you as an exercise but let us simplify this problem and solve an even simpler problem and that is I assume that this the width of this well goes to 0 and that simultaneously the depth goes to infinity such that the product is finite what would you get in the limit a delta function and I would like to have a bound state I would like to see if the potential can attract this particle and retain it in a localized form so let us assume that this is a negative delta function if it is positive it is a repulsive barrier then of course there is no possibility of any bound states you know. so let us do that problem and see what happens. attractive delta function 
attractive potential. So I have minus h cross squared over 2m phi of x. Now without further ado let us just write down the Schrodinger equation for this particle plus v of x phi of x equal to e phi of x. This is the time independent Schrodinger equation and I am trying to find out if there are eigenvalues e and non trivial eigen uh, functions phi for which this equation is satisfied and what is v of x? Let us put uh, the delta function to be anywhere on the x axis it does not matter since it is an infinite axis let us just put it at x equal to 0 right. So v of x equal to minus lambda delta of x lambda greater than 0 some constant. What are the physical dimensions of lambda? I write this down immediately you got to worry about physical dimensions. Well this is an energy, it is a potential energy, this is an energy right. So it is equal to ml squared t to the minus 2 that is an energy but this delta function has dimensions 1 over length. So when I take it to the other side it is ml cubed. So this is the problem we got to solve, pardon, p double prime, second derivative. what would you do by the way if there is a non trivial e we are trying to find out if there is one or more eigenvalues uh, what can it depend on what can it possibly depend on so before we even solve it we ask what what the hell can it possibly depend on lambda. it could depend on lambda and m and Planck's constant that is it can only depend on that there is no length scale in the problem because I said it has got 0 width so no length scale this problem has a potential which looks like this at 0 there is a delta function a negative delta function so it must depend on lambda h cross and m nothing else it cannot depend on anything else. Can you find a quantity of physical dimensions energy with respect with these three guys if you cannot then the problem is non-starter I mean uh, yes you can what is that equal to how are you going to do that. So lambda has got a t to the minus 2 and what are the dimensions of Planck's constant? So there is a t to the minus 1 and there is a lambda here it is reasonable to expect that the answer would be proportional to lambda the deeper it is the deeper the energy would be but there is a minus 2 there and you got to cancel the t's so what should you do what should I do get what should, what would be the answer what would it depend on yeah so lambda over h cross squared times m would this be reasonable m in the numerator all right what would what does that do for us that is equal that has got dimensions m squared l cubed t to the minus 2 over m squared l4 t to the minus 2 yeah 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 so what would it be m lambda squared yeah it is equal to m lambda squared over its square is that right. believe that yes okay so that is the first guess clearly when lambda goes to 0 there cannot be a bound state so it must be in the numerator okay 
So armed with that let us try to solve the problem here. Now the way to do this is this is a delta function out here. So it is obvious that what you must do is try to solve it by first looking at what happens when x is not 0 and then asking to see what happens at the boundary when x equal to 0. So for x greater than 0 it says phi double prime of x is equal to 2me over h cross squared phi with a minus sign. Now please notice that the energy levels must be negative because if it is positive there is no potential at all it is a scattering solutions. So E must be negative if it is a bound state energy because it is relative to what happens at infinite distance when there is 0 potential. So let us write this as 2m modulus E and put a plus sign here. So it is the equation is phi double prime x plus uh, minus k squared phi equal to 0 where k okay that is the first equation. What are the solutions? e to the plus or minus not i k x just k x huh? just k x. So it says x greater than 0 the solutions are phi of x equal to a e to the k x plus b e to the minus k x that is for phi x greater than 0 on the right hand side. Now you want this to be a normalizable solution therefore mod squared of phi must be finite phi must go to 0 at the very least as k tends to, as x tends to plus infinity therefore this is not permitted this is not permitted because it is not normalizable the solution therefore is of this form. Notice we put in the condition of normalizability the boundary condition at infinity has been put in and for x less than 0 what is the solution again the delta function vanishes so it is the same equation as before except it is equal to c e to the k x plus d e to the minus k x. So phi of x is again equal to c e to the k x plus d e to the minus k x and you want normalizability and this time x tends to minus infinity. So what goes to 0? D must be 0. So this is the solution. So that is for x less than 0 and you want the wave function to be continuous at the origin. So what does that imply? B equal to C. So continuity at the origin continuity implies that as you come from the left and as you go right these two must be the same. Hmm. Now once you are given this where are the, what are the unknown quantities in this B and K are unknown and if you know K then you found what energy is possible. What is the shape of the wave function? It is a double exponential so if I plot the wave shape of the wave function assuming that B is real it is something like this and something like this there is a slope uh, difference there is a cusp at the origin but it is continuous. Hmm. Now because there is a cusp at the origin the slopes are different at the origin hmm. phi of x has a discontinuity at the origin phi prime of x has a discontinuity at the origin therefore phi double prime has an infinite discontinuity and indeed it does because phi double prime has a delta function sitting there at the origin so it becomes worse and this is a really infinite discontinuity. Now how would I find B well I can find B by normalizing this guy 
I just say the whole of uh, mod phi squared from minus infinity to infinity should be equal to 1 that fixes B in terms of K. How do I find K? There is a piece of information I have not put in at all. I have not put in the information about the potential at all. How do I do that? How do I do that? So that is my solution and let us write the Schrodinger equation down properly. It is phi double prime of x minus 2m lambda by h cross squared delta of x phi of x is equal to minus 2m e by h cross squared phi of x but this guy we called k squared. That is the equation and we solved it for x less than 0, x greater than 0 in which case for delta of x did not uh, um, play any role at all. Now I need to find what this discontinuity of the slope is. So what would I do? Integrate. I would integrate both sides from where to where? Well if I integrate from minus infinity to infinity I am not going to focus on what happens at the origin you are not going to get anything really. So what should you do? Some minus epsilon to plus epsilon. I integrate on both sides and then let epsilon go to 0. So integrate minus epsilon to epsilon dx of both sides of the equation. And then let epsilon go to 0. Hmm? What does this give you? Well, it is the second derivative, so when I integrate, I get the first derivative uh, at epsilon and then minus epsilon here. So, this is says d phi over dx x tends to 0 plus from the positive side when I let epsilon go to 0 minus d phi over dx x tends to 0 minus. So, really, what you are doing is finding this slope and this slope and taking the difference of the two slopes hmm? minus 2m lambda by h cross squared. What does this give you? Phi of 0 that is it and that is a finite number minus phi of 0. In fact phi of 0 is b, just b. Huh? equal to what? equal to 0. Why is that? Because it is really the area under this curve. It is really the area under the curve well, that is finite as epsilon goes to 0 set of measures 0. So the answer is 0. It is continuous. Phi is continuous at that point equal to 0 on this side. And what is this number? d phi over dx as x goes to 0. All you have to do is to solve take the slope here and put x equal to 0 that is minus kb and then subtract from that another kb so minus 2 kb that is the equation b is not 0 because if b was 0 there would be no wave function at all and that is the equation. And the 2 goes away and you get k equal to minus why did k turn out to be negative I screwed up somewhere ah there is a minus here did I take that minus into account pardon me But that did not matter because I integrated it did not matter. Ah, V of x is minus lambda delta of x. So when I took the 2 m by h cross I put a minus sign. So there is one more minus sign so there is a plus here therefore k is this that is right okay. So k squared 2 m mod e by h cross squared equal to 
m square lambda square by h cross square k square is h cross to the 4. implies E therefore indeed mod E equal to M lambda square or 2 is this okay. and there is just a single bound state this energy is given as we expected from dimensional arguments. So the only new thing is that the exact answer was half of this combination m lambda squared over h cross squared mm -hmm. and this tells you that no matter how small lambda is this system supports a bound state which is normalizable. The wave function dies exponentially fast as you go away to x is plus or minus infinity and that is the single bound state that you have here. When you have a finite well then more bound states could happen and depending on the product of the range of this potential A times the depth V0 there is a combination V0 A squared the dimensional a quantity of dimensions V0 A squared which plays a fundamental role you get one or more bound states. Of course if you put the particle in an infinitely deep box then you have an infinite number of bound states as we saw of finite width of some finite width. So it is clear that as the depth goes higher and higher more and more bound states get supported and they are always scattering states but we are not concerned with that at the, at the moment. But I want you to notice that even a single delta function even a single point where the potential goes zoom to minus infinity and back supports a bound state in this. What would happen if you had two delta functions? What would happen? to put in one more delta function attractive potential. So let us suppose you have uh, this is origin and you have a delta function here and a symmetric delta function here. So V of x equal to minus lambda delta of x minus a plus delta of x plus a so this is minus a what do you think would happen? What would, huh, how would, how would superposition work in this case? What do you think? How do you think it would work? This brings us to the reason I do this is because it, it, it teaches us something very deep about quantum mechanical energy levels. What do you think would happen? So imagine what would happen if you took one potential very far to the left and the other one very far to the right then each of them would have a bound state of some kind. So the wave function uh, would look like this for this guy if A is very large and this far to the negative side then there would be a wave function on this side on the x axis that would be a wave function which goes like this and like this like that and on this side there would be a wave function which goes like this and goes out and both these energy levels would be degenerate. So there is an energy level here and an energy level here and they are exactly the same value minus 2m minus whatever it we found m lambda squared over h cross squared 2 h cross squared. Now you bring the guys closer together and then what would happen? tunneling is possible these wave functions would overlap huh? and what would really have what would be the situation <coughs> let us look at it in terms of uh, vector spaces if you have two independent states which are not connected to each other then the Hamiltonian in this two dimensional vector space would really look like this there is some E there is some E and there is 0 here 0 here this is what the Hamiltonian would look like in that vector space two states. Now I switch on a coupling between the two because the particle is free to move from one potential well to the other 
that would correspond to adding a little piece here and a little piece here. This is what the Hamiltonian looks like now and the energy eigenvalues are the eigenstates eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian. What happens when you diagonalize this Hamiltonian? What are the eigenvalues of this guy? Just the eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian. So, what would they be? E plus or minus epsilon. So, it will turn out that the true energy levels is slightly one of them is slightly greater than E, and the other is slightly less than E. So, if you have two states sitting on top of each other doubly degenerate and you switch on a coupling between the two then what this system does automatically is split this degeneracy and go to an excited state and a ground state that is E plus epsilon and E minus epsilon that is what would happen here because now you would solve the problem by imposing boundary conditions you would say it is 0 on this side 0 on this side. So the solution here is e to the e to the plus kappa x. The solution there is e to the minus kappa x. The solution here is a superposition of both because you you can't rule out one or the other exponential. They're both there. And then you match the wave function here. You match the wave function here. And you find the discontinuity in the slope here, and the discontinuity in the slope there. So you start by saying the solution here is a e to the kappa x. The solution here is b e to the minus kappa x plus c e to the kappa x and the solution here is d e to the minus kappa x in this region. You equate the values out here at x equal to minus a. You equate the values out here at x equal to plus a that gives you one condition between b c and d on this side you get one condition between a b and c and then you find the discontinuity here the discontinuity here that gives you another set of equations between these unknowns right. So you have four of these equations and you have a normalization condition so you have five equations but now four equations are enough to determine four constants of integration but you also need to know what kappa is possible and that the normalization constant will fix. So there is just enough information to tell you what the possible values are and in accordance with that sort of general wisdom it will turn out that you have two possible solutions two possible energy levels one of which is lower and the other is higher and what would the wave functions look like. I'll bring these guys closer together and what would the wave function look like not surprisingly one wave function would look like this this is the origin 0 it would look like this look like that and the other wave function what would that look like hmm? yeah the other wave function would look like this. look like this one of them would be symmetric and the other would be anti symmetric hmm. which do you think is going to be the symmetric solution and which, which one of them is a lower energy level and the other is a higher energy level which one is going to be the symmetric wave function which is the anti symmetric the lower one is going to be symmetric why is that why is that why is that it costs more energy cost more energy because you have a node here the anti-symmetric one there is a change of curvature and there is a node here and therefore in the Schrodinger equation remember there is a second derivative term the larger that is the more change of curvature there is the larger that is so that is going to contribute to the energy on the right hand side this is phi double prime plus potential on phi is equal to the energy on phi so roughly speaking when this phi double prime term becomes larger contributes more definitely you are going to get a larger energy. So the symmetric one the node less one is going to be the ground state and the one with the node is going to be the excited state. So I want you to work out 
the case of these two potentials out here. And then you could do 3, 4, 5, you could do an infinite array of delta function potentials. Remember by Fourier analysis an infinite array of delta function potentials is equal to an infinite array of exponentials and that problem is called the Dirac comb and it is of great interest because you would like to find out either if there are barriers or if, uh, potential levels or barriers you would like to find out what is the transmission coefficient if I put in a beam of particles here how much gets through there and then the certain amount is reflected back certain amount is transmitted and that is also a problem of some practical interest. It is called the Dirac comb I will put that down as one of the problems you have to solve. But this lesson we have learned that uh, perturbations would lift degeneracies is a very general one and this is also a very important phenomenon because typically a perturbation would lift degeneracies in the sense that crossing energy levels repel each other this is called level repulsion and that is really what happens there. It is a very basic phenomenon and responsible for many many things including the formation of forbidden gaps in energy bands in solids when you put electrons inside solids inside suitable solids you end up with forbidden gaps forbidden zones uh, forbidden regions for the energy and that is because of level repulsion ultimately okay. Now that we have done two of these problems I think I should stop here today since you have a class uh, we are ready now to go on to solving the most important one of them all the simple harmonic oscillator. But we will not do this by solving the differential equation because it involves special functions we will indicate the solution but I will show you a much cleverer method due to Dirac called the operator method which helps you to find the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions without solving the, Dirac, the second order differential equation but it is completely equivalent. Thank you.